Thank you, Cahir. Look, I noted, Minister, when you said around that there was going to be extra um, technology uh, support, and I think that is really important. But could I say one thing to you? Rather than more hardware, if you like, in terms of laptops, can you look at providing extra IT support staff? Because in all of my um, uh, visits and everything else, that is what um, the, 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 the institutions uh, seem to be crying out for. Because so they often have laptops and they have nobody to, to open the boxes to do all the necessary things around it. So IT support staff would be, uh, would be really uh, good uh, for that. Um, now, the other question I just want to ask you, just in terms of the numbers, uh, you know, will there be restrictions on the numbers in the classes on site? And what percentage of the normal class can students expect? Uh, and what constitutes a larger scale lecture in terms of numbers? I just want to get a picture of uh, what being back will really look like for students. Are some of them going to be told come in half a week, other half a week or whatever? How are you going to manage all that? That's my first question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And look, I take the point. I'll take it as I'll take it as red, so as not to waste your time. But on the on the point about the IT infrastructure, I think it's a valid point, and I'll, I'll see what more we can do in relation to that. On the issue of on site and what will on site look like, in fairness, it's it's the key question. Um, so what we have said is you, you'll have read the framework we published. So we're saying at a minimum. It is safe to come back to classrooms, workshops, tutorials, laboratories, etc. So that will happen, and that's not envisaged to happen at reduced numbers. Um, that because we've safely had people back in school classrooms now for quite some period of time and the likes. The issue, the outstanding issue that work is being done on is the lecture hall. And again, even within the lecture hall, not every lecture hall is the same size or same shape or same construct. So what we're doing now, literally over the course of this coming week, is asking the sector to look at what modifications they can put in place um, to make their lecture hall a safe environment. So I don't believe there will be a one size fits all um, scenario here because the infrastructure is very, very different. But I do think issues around, Senator O'Reilly mentioned the issue around ventilation, the issue around the length of time of a lecture, because we know the longer you spend in a room, obviously issues around face masks and the likes. So we're hoping to, the sector are hoping to bottom that out and have an understanding of that yeah. by the time our COVID steering committee meets. But my commitment on, sorry, I'll stop out this. My commitment on this is what I don't want to happen, I think is what you're, you're potentially fearing, is that all the science students all come back and off they go because they have lots of practical time. But maybe the law student who has a lot of lectures they don't come back. So I want every student to be back as much as is possible. So I do want the lecture halls used, but they will have to be used in a different way and a modified way. And it's unlikely at this point that there'll be 100 percent capacity. And that's being very honest. It's likely that lectures will be blended in some ways. But I want to make sure it's done in a fair and equitable way that everyone's getting on site. Yeah, and I think that's what we all want to achieve. I suppose what I'm trying to get into is the mindset of a second year law student, say, who's at home now thinking, am I going to be half time um, uh, on campus? Am I going to be three quarters or am I going to be full time? Because that obviously has knock on, um, 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 in, knock -on effect in terms of accommodation and, and other things as well that students are putting together as it is. And I would say to you, there's an enormous enormous pressure because of accommodation and the housing situation, particularly in Dublin, for students now trying to get accommodation arranged. It is, I've, I've never seen anything like it. And I think it's something that we all need to be aware of. And I'm sure the housing minister is aware. I want to ask you, um, Minister, as well, around the Eng English language um, education and um, particularly the stamp to visa holders who are now being told if they don't return to in-person classes, they could be deported. So do they have any recourse if there's underlying health conditions or, or if, if they work, as many of them do, in a nursing home or, or as a carer as well? And what public health advice was the decision based on to bring, I think there's 10,000 of them, um, to bring them back to in-class um, in class tuition at this particular time and what safety measures are in place in these schools. And, you know, you said that this is only for the cohort of students that are in Ireland and it's not for international recruitment. But how would that be enforced uh, given that international travel is now permitted within the EU uh, with the ELE, will the ELE schools uh, be allowed to recruit 
from within the, the EU, if you like. So what, what measures are in place there and what's the underlying health advice in putting all of those students into a class? Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Conway Walsh. So the first issue on the, on the specifics of student X, how much time will they have on site, etc. That is going to be a matter for the institutions and timetabling, and it is going to vary from institution to institution. We're starting from the point this year, though, of wanting the majority experience to be on site rather than online. Timetables will issue from institutions in the normal in the normal time. So in the over the course of the next number of weeks, obviously, and primarily through the month of August, students will start to get their individual timetables. Obviously, the prevailing public health advice is key, but never do anything to risk the health and safety of our students or our staff. The vaccine programme, I think, will do a lot of the heavy lifting um, also between now and then. We have a very clear understanding, though, that there will be a significant... Ons remember, remember, I'm sorry, you know very well what happened, obviously, in the last academic year. Effectively, everything was online. Libraries sometimes weren't open. Workshops didn't take place. Classrooms. We're saying all of that will take place now. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Minister. The ones that are right here, right now, in terms of the English language classes. Oh, sorry, I hadn't got to that yet. Because most of them are unvaccinated. This is my concern: is that we see this variant, we see the numbers in in, in increasing exponentially, and we see ten thousand unvaccinated, uh, mostly unvaccinated students. Will you maybe contradict me in that or yeah, right. give me some information yeah. on it? Thank De you. Deputy Conor Walsh, if you could give the Minister an opportunity to reply, him, he can come in then when he's finished. Sorry, I just, I just, uh, okay. Fine. Sorry. No, it's a, it's a, I, I take the point that the deputy is making. So I was sorry, I was answering the broader question about timetabling for students in mm -hmm. Irish higher education institutions. On the issue of the English language schools, and I don't mean this about you at all or your representation of this, but I do think it's been somewhat misrepresented. Um, what we're basically saying in relation to English language schools, and it is in line with the public health um, advice that we have about increasing a summer provision in relation to further and higher education. So I already said in my opening statement that as we prepare for a broader resumption of further and higher education in general in September, we're, all, we're, we're allowing a little bit more happen over the summer months. So be that in laboratories, be it in apprenticeships, be it in research. And in relation to the English language schools, all we're saying, and I'll get into the enforcement bit in a sec, but all we're saying is that students who already came to Ireland and came here in good faith, many of whom have been left somewhat, this is my view, but somewhat stranded, not blaming anyone, but because of COVID, they came to Ireland to learn English. They weren't able to access it because schools were closed. I think we have a duty of care to them. And while you said 10,000 students, the average number in a class here is seven. So we're talking about a situation way fewer students than were ever in a primary school class or ever in a secondary school class. And we're talking about also, and I want to be really clear on this, I'm not telling the English language school you must open. They remain they, they may opt to remain closed, they may, they may opt to provide blended learning or to continue to operate wholly online. And the resumption of in-person activity is subject to there being no deterioration in the public health situation, nor change to any public health advices which I've yet uh, to receive. So we, we see this as a very, very, very small, cautious, conservative uh, stepping stone on a pathway to broader recovery. There has been a, volunt a voluntary moratorium in place in relation to recruitment of new students. And let me be really clear, I do not want to see new students recruited into the English language education sector currently. I I'd like us to get to that point. We're not at that point yet. If there were breaches of that, I would view that very seriously. I'd view it as a breach of faith in terms of the agreement that we have with the sector, and I'd act accordingly. And just in relation to the visa issue, you'll know I'm going to say it is a matter for the Minister for Justice, because it is. Um, but I would not like to see any student, any student at all, uh, lose out or face, you know, alterations to their visa terms and conditions as a result of not being able to attend a lecture for an underlying health condition. And I will pursue that on foot of your representation directly with my colleague, the Minister for Justice. OK, good. Uh, um can I, can I ask one more? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead uh, Deputy, yeah. Because okay, I wouldn't like to leave Minister Collins out. Minister Collins, you said there was over 10,000 apprentices on the waiting list um, when we spoke uh, last uh, in, in July. But now I've received figures that um, from your department that said the number was in fact 13,440 at the end of June. And that is a, a, a huge increase. That means that there's something like 67% of all apprenticeships uh, uh, waiting for off-site training. So I'm really concerned about that. I'm also concerned, Minister, that 
um, there were savings of 6.7 million euro in 2020 due to the reduced numbers of apprentices accessing uh, the offsite training. Um, and only 12 million was allocated to address the backlog in the waiting list. So could you make sense of all that for me, please? Because I really, really am concerned about the apprentices. And I know and I've welcomed the new announcements around new apprenticeships, broadening the range, increasing the numbers, all of that. But we have 67 percent of all apprentices waiting for this uh, training as it is. So thanks. Yes. Th thanks, Deputy Conway Walsh. Um, and, and you're right. And Minister Harris and I in the entire department share um, the concern which you have articulated there in relation to the backlog. Um, there, there's no point in, in I uh, articulating or explaining how the backlog has arose. You're, you're well aware of that due to the uh, various lockdowns that we've received, that, that we had to endure um, since March of 2020. And given the nature of um, the fact that um, the, the training has to take, the vast majority of training um, off the job training has to take place in person across our uh, further education training centres or institutes of technology and our technological universities. So, so obviously uh, we were constrained in relation to that. The uh, figures which I quoted to you in the Dáil um, at, at our recent oral PQ session, um, you're correct. That was the end of May figures. So obviously you, you have received uh, the updated figures from the department. And we're, we have, we're continually engaging with SOLAS and with, our, with the Higher Education Authority and with all of the stakeholders across the sector. So there's, there's two, obviously, there's two main stakeholders. There's the apprentices themselves and there's the, um, the, the providers, the training providers. The, the public servants working in our further education training centres and our ETBs and our technological universities. They are working might and main to address uh, the backlog. They're, they're well aware of the, the pressures that that's uh, creating on the system and on the individuals in terms of the um, uh, in terms of allowing them to progress with their careers and also that, that's feeding through into the, the various sectors that these apprentices will ultimately work in. So um, the, the vast majority of the backlog is to do with the craft apprentices. You, you're aware of that also. So we pri prioritised a return to on-site learning in March of 2021. And th th this will continue right throughout the summer months, subject to, to public health advice with restricted numbers. And um, there's a three-step plan um, being drawn up to tackle the backlog, particularly in the craft apprenticeships, uh, with, with a view to um, addressing the, the backlog over a 12 to 15 month period. And that's been worked on by SOLAS and the further and higher education providers. So in, in addition to that, um, just to make you aware, and I think I would have said this to you, um, when you when you raised the issue in the Dáil recently, an additional 20 million euros in capital expenditure was provided to Solace and the Higher Education Authority to facilitate um, to facilitate 4,000 craft apprenticeship places across the system, and an additional 12 million was already allocated to support additional classes and teaching capacity. So the, we are aware of it. The department is aware of it. Our, our um, dedicated public servants right across the sectors are um, aware of it and they are dedicated to addressing the problem in terms of a, a plan and addressing the backlog over a period of time. So I hope that addresses it for you. Definitely. Okay, Th th thank you very much.